Hey everybody, welcome to PC Perspective. I'm Ryan Shrout. We are here today to talk about AMD's latest processor release. Now we're looking at Ryzen 5. Uh, last month we looked at Ryzen 7. That was AMD's competitor to the Core i7, uh, Kaby Lake processors, and Broadwell E processors. Now we're looking at the lower cost variants, uh, Ryzen 5. These vary from $249 for the Ryzen 5 1600X down to $169 for the Ryzen 5 1400. So this is a much more mainstream processor. This is really going up against Intel's Core i5 lineup uh, all across the board. And there's a couple of interesting things we want to talk about. Uh, so first off, the important specifications here really come down to your core counts. All of the Core i5 processors that we look at in this review, uh, the 7600K, 70, 600, 7500, and 7400 are all quad core, four threads, right? So they do not have hyperthreading enabled. You've got four cores, four threads. Uh, that is not the case with the AMD Zen processors, the Ryzen processors. Uh, the Ryzen 5 1600X actually is a six core, 12 thread processor, uh, as is the 1600 part, uh, while the 1500X and the 1400 are quad core eight thread processors. So automatically, you know, you're going to get a pretty big advantage uh, on the AMD side in terms of multi-threading, multi-core capability. Uh, with the 1600X, you know, kind of their flagship of the Ryzen 5 line, you have 50% more cores and I think, you know, 3X as many threads, right? Instead of going four threads with the, Ryzen, uh, with the Core i5-7600K, you have 12 threads, right? So that's going to make a, a big impact on, you know, your Cinebench, your, your uh, handbrake encoding, uh, your blender rendering, those types of applications that really are heavily threaded, that's going to make a big impact for you. Uh, now in terms of clock speeds, the 1600X runs at the same clock speed as the 1800X that was the 8-core 16-thread part. So 3.6 gigahertz base, 4 gigahertz, uh, kind of on its uh, peak turbo boost uh, capability there. And then the 1500X, which is the other processor we actually got in-house in to do testing on, is a 3.5 gigahertz base to 3.7 gigahertz boost. So those clock speeds, um, put them within range of the Intel Core i5 parts. Intel still has a slight advantage. Uh, their 7600K goes up to 4.2 gigahertz. The 7500 goes up to 3.8. Those are the direct competitors in those placements. Um, but you do get, you know, you get 16 megs of cache on the 1600X and the 1500X, and it's not until you get down to the 1400 that it actually gets cut in half to eight megs of cache. All of the Core i5s have six. Now, none of that really matters until we look at performance and the metrics that you're all uh, very interested in. Um, the, the story is very similar to where we saw the Ryzen 7 parts. And single-threaded benchmarks, things that are, are very much single-threaded bound. Uh, if you look at our Cinebench single-threaded results, if you look at Sysoft Sandra, if you look at um, Geekbench, our single-threaded results, you're gonna find that the Intel Core i5 7600K is anywhere from you know seven to 19, 13 percent. You know the, the you know there's going to be up you know pretty high double digit percentage deficits that the AMD processors are at, uh, and that is again comparing the 1600X to the 7600K on the Intel side and the 1500X to the Core i5 7500. Those are the kind of the best uh, uh, price matchups that we are able to come up with. When you look at multi-threaded results. It obviously swings very heavily the other way in AMD's favor. Uh, if you look at uh, Handbrake, for example, the 1600X, the Ryzen 5 1600X, is 30% faster than the Core i5-7600K. Even more interesting, perhaps, is that the Ryzen 5 1500X, the quad-core eight-threaded part that it is, is actually uh, still 21% faster than the uh, 7600K. Okay, so you get these uh, big advantages for um, the 1600X and the 1500X over anything in the Core i5 lineup where uh, you, you know, your, your multi-threaded capability is, is really there. So that's, that's obviously good if you do a lot of rendering, if you do a lot of media encoding, if you do a lot of heavy uh, multi-threaded application workloads or, or heavy uh, multi-application workloads, you're going to see the advantage of having more cores and more threads for sure. Now, the big debate we've had with Ryzen 7 came with gaming performance. We want to make sure we talk about that here. Uh, there was an argument to be made with the Ryzen 7 that, hey, 1080p benchmarks weren't as relevant. I disagree with that statement, uh, but that is not even close to being an argument with the Ryzen 5 parts. 1080p gaming is very important for parts that are around 200 bucks, 249 down to 169. That's kind of its target market right there. Um, 
And again, the results are about the same that we saw with Ryzen 7. Uh, if we look at games that are considered a tie, we expanded out from four to eight different PC games in our, in our testing. Games that I would consider a wash or a tie are Ashes of the Singularity, Civilization VI, and Deus Ex Mankind Divided. That is where the 1600X and the 7600K kind of performed on par with one another there. Uh, AMD was actually slightly ahead in Hitman, the new DX12 version of Hitman, uh, but if you look at the other games, Far Cry Primal, Grand Theft Auto V, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and uh, the new Ghost Recon Wildlands, the Intel parts were ahead by noticeable margins yet again. 21%, 17%, 29%, and 7%. So those are, again, fairly sizable deltas um, that uh, AMD still needs to kind of figure out what their stance is on this is you know they they did the work they made the announcement with ashes of the singularity escalation and, and talked about the engine development work that they did and how they're able to improve performance by 20 30 percent uh, across the board on that are they going to be able to do that going forward right so that's still an area of contention that the ryzen 5 is going to have to deal with just like the ryzen 7 part did now, uh, we did in this review a couple of extra things in performance testing that we didn't do with the Ryzen 7 because of the debates and discussions that ha have happened since that initial launch. Uh, first and foremost, we did memory scaling testing. We ran uh, the Ryzen uh, 1600X at 2133 megahertz DDR4, 2400, 2933, and 3200 megahertz memory, so a, a wide range of memory. I mean, we measured how, I think, 10, 12 different benchmarks compared and scaled across the board. Which ones showed advantages, which ones showed no advantage to the increase in memory. Um, if you look at the general performance benchmarks, our uh, Cinebench, our Handbrake, Blender, um, those types of things, you're looking at really just like one, two, maybe 3% performance improvement, going from 2133 all the way up to 3200 megahertz memory. So our, our widest gap showed only one to two to three megahertz worth of performance delta there. Um, but if you look at games, we saw a much more significant increase. So if you look at Rise of the Tomb Raider, it went up 12% in that same memory performance gap. It went up 14% in Hitman, 12% in GTA 5, but interestingly only 2% in Ghost Recon Wildlands, indicating that while it is a, a solution to improve gaming performance on these platforms for some games, probably not all games. And it's worth noting in the benchmarks I talked about just prior to this, all of our testing was run at 2400 megahertz, which is the standard uh, out of the box maximum memory speed without going into overclocking settings uh, for both the AMD Ryzen platform and the Intel Core i5 platform. Uh, we also did uh, Windows 10 power modes testing where we looked at, we ran, I think, again, the same 12, 14 benchmarks uh, in uh, standard balanced mode out of the box from Windows and then high performance mode. And we show some differences there. And really, other than the web expert benchmark that saw a 14% gain, everything else was limited to you know, 1%, 2%, maybe even nothing at all. And couple that with the testing and, and write-up we did on AMD's release of their own kind of AMD optimized balance mode. I again, I, I don't see that as the uh, the silver bullet to solve all of AMD's problems. It's going to be a little bit of a percentage uh, in a couple of different places, just like I think memory scaling is a few percentage points in a f handful of places. Uh, obviously, if you start to combine these things, you maybe get into a, a better overall picture for AMD, uh, but it's not the answer to every uh, performance complaint that has uh, arisen no pun intended, with the Ryzen uh, processors. So that's our summation of the review. Um, the 1600X at $249 is an amazing part when you compare it to the Core i5 7600K that is 10 bucks less expensive. You're getting six cores instead of four, 12 threads instead of four, comparable clock speeds. Uh, the TDP is, is similar as well. Uh, you're gonna have some overclocking headroom. Uh, one of the other advantages, which is why I have this box out here, is the B350 motherboards that AMD is recommending although you can use X370 boards, the B350 boards that you can use or should use with the Ryzen 5, they're less expensive, but they still offer overclocking capability for your memory and your processor. The Intel equivalent, the B250 motherboards, do not offer the overclocking capabilities. So uh, in terms of being able to get value out of your system so that you can do uh, some more tweaking and overclocking, you want to get 
uh, DDR4-3200 memory and throw that in your Ryzen 5 system because you got a deal on it. Uh, you'll be able to do that and run it on the B350 motherboard, no hassle. Uh, and in our, my time with this MSI Tomahawk board, it was a very smooth, easy experience to do. You cannot necessarily do that with the lowest cost Intel boards of the same ilk. Which uh, brings us to the, the summary of all of this. Um, the what we don't have here is a huge price advantage. Remember the 1800X came out and it was $500 less expensive uh, than the 6900K from Intel. And that kind of told the whole story. Um, with the Ryzen 5, you know, the, the market segment is, is more compressed, the pricing is compressed. And so, you know, in actuality, if you buy the higher end memory, you may be paying 10, 20, $30 more for the Ryzen 5 equivalent of the Core i5. Um, for, for general consumption, general performance, general application usage, the Ryzen 5 processors do amazing, and anything that's multi-threaded capable, they blow away the competition from Intel. In the gaming side, there's a little bit more debate still to be had, right? It's, it's, it's still gonna perform well. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna have major complaints, but if you want the fastest possible uh, processor you can get for even 1080p gaming, um, then the Core i5 still had the advantage in the vast majority of our testing. So that's something worth keeping in mind. If you're gaming at 1440p, or you know you plan on going to 4K someday down the road, and this is this is the platform you're starting with, those differences are going to mitigate and 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 uh, wither away as the resolution increases. Um, but 1080p is still the focus for this. I think for the price segment, it makes sense to do. So uh, I would encourage everybody to go to PCPro.com, read our full review. We've got a ton more benchmarks. So you can see all the gaming comparisons, all the application comparisons there, and uh, get our, our final summation in that written review as well. So we'll be following up on this. We have a lot more testing on Ryzen 5 to do, including overclocking, power consumption, uh, more motherboards. Can we compare B350 to B250 and what features and experience differences you get there? A lot more to come from uh, our coverage of the ongoing release of AMD Ryzen processors. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting in-depth technical content by contributing at patreon.com slash pcper.